I would love to um, uh, <clears throat> I would love to uh, uh, tell you why we we organize this event. Uh, I believe Dutch planning is in constant evolution and it needs to contend with new challenges that didn't exist before and successive crises. The climate crisis is forcing us to reimagine how this tiny country needs to be spatially organized. The housing crisis we are facing now is maybe what, only comparable to the housing shortage after World War II and COVID-19 has highlighted uh, new challenges for, for us all. Um, this evolution, the evolution of Dutch planning happens based on a long tradition of planning and design of the built environment, dealing with an extraordinary fragile environment, the delta of a major European river, which forced the Dutch to develop a very specific societal model based on consensus seeking faith in institutions and collective action. It is in this tradition that old and new Dutch planners work. Planning education in the Netherlands has internationalized very quickly. And as I said, it's also in constant evolution. From some quarters, we hear uh, fear that some of the Dutch planning tradition may be lost. I believe that one doesn't need to be Dutch to teach and learn Dutch planning as Andreas uh, really clearly exemplifies. And we are all contributing to how Dutch planning is shaping up in the 21st century. Without further ado, uh, I want to introduce the two people who are going to, to illuminate the debate today and help us um, recover some of the details of, of this uh, Dutch history of planning, but also the relationship with the um, um, European, the Association of European Schools of Planning, ASAP, uh, of which I'm, um, I'm um, one country representative. Um, I'm, I'm just a sub substitute. But uh, we are interested in this relationship, how, how the Netherlands has influenced ASAP and how ASAP has influenced planning in the Netherlands. Willem Salat is Professor Emeritus of Urban and Regional Planning at the Department of Planning Geography and International Development Studies at the University of Amsterdam. He chaired uh, urban planning at UVA from 1998 to 2017. He was the scientific director of Amsterdam Study Center for the Metropolitan Environment, AME, from 97 to 2003. He was the president of ASAP from 2008 to 2010. As a sociologist and urban planner, Professor Salet specializes in the institutional aspects of metropolitan development. He investigates the cultural, legal, and political dimensions of public norms in the making of sustainable metropolitan spaces. And we also have here today, Professor Andreas Faludi, who's Professor Emeritus at the Chair of Spatial Planning and Strategy at the Department of Urbanism at TU Delft. Um, he studied architecture and urban planning at the Technical University of Vienna, where he is right now. And in his English period, Faludi brought together different lines of planning theory and connected these to the philosophical debate around critical rationalism. Through, this action, through his actions, um, the planning discipline managed to develop a strong theoretical foundation. Um, Faludi settled in Amsterdam later where he was seized by the special character of the Dutch planning of which he became one um, very, very strong voice. Without further ado, sorry for this very long introduction. Um, here we have a uh, professor, uh, I will give the floor to Professor Salet first. Thank you for being here, Professor. Uh, the floor thank, is yours. Thank you very much, uh, Roberto, for your kind introduction and for your invitation. Uh, it's, it's really exciting to see so many people from ASOP uh, and, and also many students and uh, teachers from the Technical University of Delft. Um, <coughs> in this time of Corona, I'm really uh, 
missing all these uh, faces of, of people in the world of, of planning nowadays. Um, my talk will be about uh, planning in transition and well, everything is in transition nowadays, but this certainly goes for the spatial planning in the Netherlands. I will try to share my PowerPoints. Share. Yes, there they are. Okay. Um, my talk is about a few, a, a short talk. Uh, first of all, what is the inspiration of ASOP for spatial planning in the Netherlands? Uh, then I uh, will explain very shortly a particular, a particular uh, approach of planning that I take uh, by uh, distinguishing uh, public norms and aspirations of planning. I think that's an important distinction. And I will use this distinction in order to analyze the case of national planning in the Netherlands. And this national planning will be subdivided in four epochs. And then at the end, we, uh, we may debate the future of, of planning in the Netherlands that changed a lot over this period. Um, well, the inspiration of, of, of ASOP, I must say in, in, in that way first, that ASOP inspired us a lot. That certainly goes for me. I, uh, my first time at ASOP was uh, in 1996. Uh, Andreas was among the founding fathers and that's uh, 20 years earlier or 15 years. When was it exactly Andreas? I don't know. It, you're muted. I cannot unmute <laughs> you. Okay. Okay. Yes, uh, I, I, yes I'm, I'm muted myself. Yes, it was at around 1980, but I'm not exactly sure about the date. Okay. Uh, did you could you listen now? Uh, yes. Okay. Good. Thank you. Well, my uh, my first time at ASOP was uh, at, at the conference in uh, Aveiro in, in Portugal. Which was, I think, in 1996. There I met people like Patsy Healy and Rachel Alterman, and uh, they inspired me a lot. And, and since then, I, I came every year to the annual conferences of, of ASOP, which are important moments in a time of, of, of planning. Um, so I, I found a lot of inspirations there. But there's also the way around from the, 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 the planning in the Netherlands to, uh, to our colleagues abroad, there was a lot of inspiration of the first generation of post-war Dutch planning. Um, it, it is actually, it is well recorded in the book by uh, Andreas Faludi and, and uh, Van der Valk about the Dutch planning doctrine. And there the Dutch planning was taken as, as a sort of export product to other countries. And um, 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 I think uh, one of the reasons for this was that at the national level, there was not, not so much planning in other countries of, U of Europe. Of course, there was local planning and in many regions was also a sort of spatial planning, but at the national level, there were not many examples by that time. And um, the Dutch, well, the Netherlands is a very small country, so it's not so unique to have it. I think it's, it's necessary in this country to have planning at the spatial planning at the national level. Uh, but nowadays we don't. And I will tell you some of the major transitions since then. Um, and at present, there is no national planning at the national level, no national spatial planning. It's in the make. There are some ideas of it and some small uh, uh, examples of it, but it's not really the national planning that we were used to have for many decades. Well, um, 
tells me I will take today um, a particular approach to, to analyze uh, the spatial planning in the Netherlands. After my retirement five years ago, I had time to reflect and to write some new books. And one of these books was uh, labeled, entitled, uh, Public Norms and Aspirations. Um, I think uh, when we study the legitimacy and effectiveness of planning, then we have to search it at two uh, distinctive dimensions. The first is the institutional dimension of setting public norms. Uh, I, I use the term institution in a sociological sense. With institutions, I mean uh, sets of public norms. And these norms may be substantive uh, or they may be uh, procedural, uh, like rules of the game. Um, um, I think this is an important dimension, this uh, uh, setting of, of public norms in a society to condition all sorts of planned and unplanned aspirations. And the aspirations, these are the second dimension. Here we talk about goal-oriented action, the purposive dimension of planning. It is particularly uh, in theory, it is uh, uh, developed by pragmatism. I think the roots of pragmatism are still, uh, that they are from 100 years ago in the United States, but they are still dominant in present day uh, approaches of planning, interactive planning, communicative planning, learning processes of planning. The scientific and meta scientific roots of these uh, planning approaches today go back to uh, uh, the philosophy of, of pragmatism. Um, and it's, it focuses in, point in, uh, in particular on the solving of problems. That's what they do. Uh, I think this is extremely important for planning to solve problems and to, uh, to uh, uh, achieve uh, certain aspirations. But I also believe that uh, purposive systems uh, run, of course, when they are not adequately supported, endorsed by institutionalized sets of public norms. And here's the problem. We sometimes neglect this dimension of institutions. And this happened in particularly in practice. That's my statement today that we need uh, to endorse planning perspectives, pragmatic planning perspectives by, um, by, by sets of public norms. And the interaction between these two dimensions is crucial in my view. Okay, let's see how we, uh, how, how we did this in the Netherlands in our national planning system of spatial planning. Uh, I will give a, a brief historic overview in the perspective of the interrelationships between institutionalization and pragmatism. The first, as the first period, I take uh, 96 to 1975. Um, I think this was the best period of uh, national spatial planning uh, because the two dimensions were in balance. Uh, it started with the planning law in, uh, from 1963. We already had one national report on planning, but this planning law uh, gave a foundation, a legal foundation to it. It was introduced in 1963, but uh, we already had 20 years debate in the country about the planning system when the Germans had occupied the Netherlands in the Second World War, they introduced a very hierarchical system of spatial planning. And after the war, uh, it, it became clear that uh, we couldn't continue with this hierarchical model, but on the other hand, we needed national planning. And um, then at the end of this debate, they came up with, um, uh, with a system of planning which is based on the principle of 
subsidiarity. Um, the national planning was possible, but only in an indicative and global way, and it depended, in order to bind the citizens, it depended on the local planning systems. Only local plans had an external uh, impact on the citizens. So this was a very subtle system. Um, and the, the, the most important institutional principle was the principle of subsidiarity. But um, the elder people uh, among the audience will remember that the end of the 1960s and the early 1970s was a particular epoch, a particular post-war time. It was the time of a very politicized, uh, uh, politicized planning. Um, I, uh, well, the younger uh, generation took over the power of the recent desk, uh, older generation. That's how we, I say we, I was young in that time as well. Uh, we took over the power in all fields of society, even from the, the, the military, uh, 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 the, 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 even the organization of the military organization in society with a lot of participation from the bottom up. Um, and this certainly was also the case in, uh, in, uh, in, in spatial planning. The young generation had very uh, progressive ideals about the future of planning, and they had no patience with other ideas. I remember that uh, our uh, uh, godness, God was uh, Jane Jacobs, with an idea of diversity, social diversity in cities, dense, compact cities, with a lot of attention for public transportation, social housing, public spaces, compact cities um, uh, that should not uh, suburbanize in wide urban fields. That was the, the, the major progressive idea of the younger generation by the time. But coming into power at the national level, where new national reports of spatial planning were made, they could not shit from their hips. I regretted that by the time. But actually, what happened is that the institutional dimension urged the planners to deliberate, uh, well, what is our position? Uh, um, we are only at the national level, we can only uh, have indicative planning and global ideas, and we depend on the local, uh, on the municipalities and their power to bind the citizens with harder sorts of, of instruments. So um, the, this led to, um, I, in my view, a very good deliberation on on what actually was the position, the normative position from without the planners were enabled by the legislation to act. Uh, substantive norms were uh, not provided at the national level and still not, uh, a few very small, but actually it is difficult to have substantive norms at national level when all local contexts are extremely different then you have to provide fair ways of uh, decision making. And you can give as a national government uh, argumentative ideas that can be uh, incalculated by the local and regional planners. So by the time uh, the planning was bounded by norms of subsidiarity and the sovereignty of, uh, of communities. Um, I think when I come to the conclusion of this first epoch, that there was a delicate balance of public norms and aspirations. Then we moved to the second period from 1975 to 95. Uh, I call this a triumph of purposivism. Um, um, in, in, in practice, um, centralized aspiration began to dominate the norms of subsidiarity. The planning law was not changed. It was the same planning law, but the practice changed dramatically in that 
the uh, national government, the spatial planners at, uh, planners at the national level, uh, uh, began to dominate the field of planning by um, uh, coordinating with other ministries, policies for the future. It was a time of centralization. The famous, the most famous uh, national report in this time was the so-called Ford Nota, and it had an addendum. Uh, well, this VNEX program uh, programmed uh, the location of 600 homes. That's a lot, uh, including detailed contracts of implementation about not just about housing, but also about infrastructure and uh, nature and, and all sorts of, of, of contracts in a very centralized way. And uh, a lot of this uh, report has been implemented. So in that way, you may say, if you uh, look at the objectives, it was successful. But if you want to change the objectives after some times, and then if you have to adapt the policies, well, you have long-term contracts uh, in a centralized way, then uh, sometimes there were also a lot of problems of adaptation. There was a disbalance of central policy aspirations with norms of subsidiarity. We began, to, we began in that period to neglect uh, the basic idea of subsidiarity which was the central uh, institutional foundation of spatial planning in the Netherlands. And then we go to the third period in, um, uh, from 90, sorry, uh, from uh, 95 to 215. I call it lost in splendid isolation. What happened in this period, and I give you my personal view as I... Uh, <laughs> I can talk an hour about it, but in, in my view, what happened in this period is that the central government developed its own purposes at far distance of practices uh, with sky high aspirations, but uh, it, it was not landing on earth. The fifth national report, the draft version of it was uh, rumors say, uh, mostly written by the minister itself, Minister Pronk. He was a very progressive and uh, idealist uh, uh, person. Nothing wrong with that. Um, but there were more aspirations in this uh, report. For instance, um, um, talking about new urban regions that were much larger than the urbanization in, in practice. Um, that it was problematic to find uh, um, um, to, to find uh, outcomes of this kind of, of, of planning. Uh, what happened in the year zero, the national spatial planning is abolished. And uh, we as planners, we like to say, well, it was uh, the role of neoliberalism. It was a political decision to, to cancel the spatial planning of national level. Well, of course, the liberals were not very supportive of national spatial planning and maybe even less the Christian Democrats uh, that were also in power. But it's not just a matter of political ideology. The fact that they could be removed so easily without much friction also meant that planning was uh, swerving too high in the sky, and uh, it did not really make a large dis difference to have them or not. And this is why they disappeared so easily, in, in my personal view. Um, they had forgotten about the institutional base and were got lost somewhere in purposive aspirations. That's my interpretation of this. Now we come in the present period from 2015 to, to, to now actually, where a new uh, planning law is made, the new Environment and Planning Act. Um, and this is a, a mega act, it's unbelievable. Um, it's, it's a comprehensive law, uh, 
a mega level coordination of 26 sectors going from infrastructure to housing to the and so on. They're all involved, all included. And the, I, the basic idea behind this coordination is that uh, we cannot have different sectors that make their own decisions. Um, we must think in a holistic way, in a comprehensive way, and um, coordinate all these different sectors in one umbrella plan. It's, it's a simple, flexible, very integrative idea of planning. So in, we, we can have it all at once. It is, as, as Hayek used to say, it is uh, uh, so, so simple and so easy to understand. Uh, but a victim of synoptic delusion. Um, planning is a complex matter. And if you bring all these things together in one mega decision, the, idea, the basic idea is that you have one mega decision going for 10 years at the three levels of government. So the central government, the provinces and the municipalities make the comprehensive decision. And then you would say, is this flexible if you do this for the next 10 years, a coordinated decision like this? Um, yes, it is flexible because the uh, possibility to adapt is given to the administration, to the minister, and to the uh, uh, all governors also at the lower scales. Um, this is the definitive move to what I call the epoch of managerialism. Um, it gives an unprecedented delegation to the administration, uh, where um, usually there is the countervailing powers between the legislator, the government, and the court. Uh, in order to prevent um, a concentration of power within one of the organs of the state, here all power goes to the administration. It is in an open way delegated to the administration. As <coughs> parliament, you may say, well, okay, um, we make all sorts of amendments when the mega decision is made. Of course, that's possible, but it's not very attractive to do this. To give you an idea, only at the level of, of municipalities in the city of Amsterdam, 1100 zoning plans are integrated in this umbrella plan. And then I'm all, only talking about the spatial sector, the 26 sectors that are integrated in this plan. I have an open delegation to the elder man to, to make small adaptations that are no longer controlled by the representatives and not by, by the court. So also not by the citizens. So I'm, I'm not optimistic about this uh, new planning law. I think it's not practical to integrate so many different ways of, of intervention. And it's too simple uh, for a very complex society this uh, contradiction is, is too large. And by organizing all powers uh, in the hands of managerial in, uh, administration, it makes me af afraid sometimes. So uh, at the moment, we are living in an epoch of deinstitutionalization. It's a revolutionary shift of powers to administrative management. That's what the new law in my new planning law in my very biased and personal view is bringing today. And when I look to the next coming years, I think uh, we, the, the spatial planning may return at the national level. As I said, the Netherlands is a very small country. And having no spatial planning ideas at the national level is really a problem. Um, in the last uh, cabinet period, there were crises of nitrogen uh, with, with an, uh, a, a, a very difficult uh, law case against the state. Um, crisis of, of the airport extension, housing crisis, 
there's a lot of uh, very problematic uh, climate policy um, and it needs uh, the uh, spatial planning deliberation. I'm convinced of this. Well, at present, uh, uh, some uh, four political parties are talking about the new cabinet and some of these parties uh, think of uh, reinstalling the uh, spatial planning at the national level again. It would be nice, but I'm not sure whether our profession is ready for a new uh, generation of planning. Did we learn our lessons? I'm, I'm not sure of this. Um, actually, when I see uh, how uh, th this new planning law is introduced, I'm not optimistic. When we meet over four years again, I uh, hope to be a bit more optimist. Well, to conclude, the current problems of spatial planning are not just that they reflect international trends of supra-modernization. However, signs of the re renaissance of institutional reflection are in USA, where um, um, people, uh, and certainly our colleagues in planning are depressed after the, the, the Trump uh, epoch, of course. Um, but they, they understand that we need a better institutional reflection about the basic norms, about their role in, in planning issues. And also in other European countries. In the Netherlands, we are talking, for instance, at the moment about the problems of the state of law. And this is a particular institutional debate that I see in several countries at the moment. So for the future, I think we have to, to think more about this uh, dimension. Um, in, in this sense, uh, it may deepen and refresh the case of planning. Well, let me end with these positive and optimistic words. Thank you. Thank you so very much, Professor Salet. Um, uh, we are going to, to open the floor for, for uh, people to, to talk to you in a few minutes. Uh, there are 63 people online with us today from all over the world. I see many um, um, known names, uh, friends uh, from uh, Spatial Planning who always participate in our, uh, uh, in our seminars. Before we give the floor to the audience, uh, I'd like to invite Professor Andreas Faludi to uh, comment and uh, tell us a little bit about his story as well. Uh, Andreas, just keeping in mind a little bit the, the, the time, so uh, yes, please go um, on. <laughs> I am on. Can you listen? Yes. The uh, microphone we can, is on. Good. We can you hear you. Well, uh, first of all, let me um, yes comment immediately, uh, but only briefly. Um, um, my studying large planning ended in 1995, so it's at the end of period two, which Willem Salet uh, um, discussed. Um, in 1995, I started on a completely different venture, studying European planning, and. Uh, since then, uh, I've been totally engrossed in uh, studying what, first of all, the European spatial development perspective and, uh, and, and other issues around uh, this, this idea of European spatial planning. I'm not optimistic about that either, and, uh, uh, but this is a different story altogether. I'm saying this because I'm, I'm really not terribly qualified now uh, for uh, uh, reacting to Willem Select immediately. Uh, uh, because I left the scene when Dutch planning was at its uh, its its high point, yes? and uh, uh, the book which which we wrote in 1994 uh, expresses this. It's about Dutch planning doctrine and and how well successful Dutch planning doctrine had been up to that point. Um, incidentally, at that time we were also. Uh, thinking about what's the future. And um, uh, William Quartus Altus, uh, who did his PhD with me and with, uh, um, with Arnold van der Valk, uh, 
we, we were thinking about the uh, doctrinal revolution, that, uh, this, this wonderful Dutch doctrine, which at, up to that point had uh, uh, succeeded in keeping the Netherlands in shape uh, and in developing the Netherlands, whether this would uh, disappear. And uh, um, well, in the meantime, it has disappeared, but it may be coming back. That's what we have heard from Bidem Soleil. Uh, I really want to, uh, if I may, correct William only on one point, and uh, that is uh, Dutch planning has not been a, a German import. The German, the German occupying forces and the, uh, the administration which the Germans set up allowed Dutch planners to live out their fantasies about na national planning. Uh, it, 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 it wasn't that the Germans said, you must do that, you are allowed to do that. No, what the Germans said, oh, you had the idea of national planning, go ahead with it. Yes? But it was a Dutch idea. Uh, and I have documentation for that. But, uh, I, I'm saying this because uh, uh, Dutch national planning was always accused of being a German invention. But in actual fact, it has not. It has lived out the ambitions of Dutch planners. Uh, um, okay, having said all this, now uh, really I've prepared myself for talking about ESOP. And maybe before. Uh, I do that uh, very briefly because it has been hinted at my own relation with the Netherlands. I, I, yes, I, I, I did my PhD in, in Vienna. Um, uh, don't rush, it's, it's, it's not an important document. Um, I immediately after doing my PhD, I went to the United Kingdom for various reasons and uh, st uh, studied sociology for one year uh, in addition to my PhD in planning and then started lecturing in, uh, at the, the Oxford College of Technology, later to become the Oxford University, uh, the Oxford Polytechnic, and now the Oxford Brookes University. And indeed, at that time, I was able to draw on American uh, planning theory and develop the idea of planning theory. And on that basis, I got myself appointed to a chair at, actually at, uh, at Delft University of Technology in 1974. Uh, to a chair of spatial planning, uh, Stedebaum, as it was then called. Very quickly, between three or four years, I, I switched to a chair in, in Amsterdam. And that was a totally different chair. It was a chair in planology, planology which is a, a, a German and a, a, a Dutch term for planning theory, science of planning, what have you. Uh, and uh, for about 20 years, I, uh, I was incumbent of that particular chair, and it was really that then when I started to uh, uh, studying uh, the Dutch national planning. Um, now, um, ESOP. ESOP was set up somewhere at around the end of the 1970s, beginning of the 1980s. It was an initiative of Klaus Kunzmann from Dortmund in Germany. And uh, this is significant because Dortmund in Germany was at that time the only full planning education in the whole of Germany. Uh, full planning education, meaning that after secondary school, uh, people started studying planning for nominally four years. It was a revolutionary thing to do. It was contrary to the uh, German tradition of planning education, uh, which was very much related to architecture. Now, um, I myself was invited to participate. Uh, Louis Albrecht was uh, invited. Um, Patsy Healy was there. And with the exception of Patsy Healy, I'll turn to that in a minute, all these planning causes which were represented at the meeting in, and it was at Kappenberg, organized by uh, uh, Klaus Kunzmann, were in a minority. They were on the defensive. They had to fight their way in because they, they brought some, some, something new. Uh, Patsy Healy represented uh, uh, British planning, and British planning was at its azimuth at that time. It was fully institutionalized, and the planning courses, the planning education, was fully institutionalized and accepted. And it still is. Why? Because of the existence of the Royal Town Planning Institute. The Royal Town Planning Institute is an institution 
that has no equivalent on the continent of Europe. It's called a qualifying institution, which is an old tradition in the United Kingdom. Uh, um, in, in the United Kingdom, new so-called qualifying associations for engineers, for surveyors, and also for, for planners, which set their own entrance examinations. So the Royal Town Planning Institute had, at that time, it was called the Town Planning Institute, set its qualifying examination in, back in 1916, I believe. So that somebody who wanted to call himself a chartered town planner or a qualified town planner had to uh, pass an examination set by the planners themselves, by the town planning institute itself. Now, in the course of time, and this is quite, was quite a standard pattern in the United Kingdom. It wasn't the universities that took the lead for educating professionals. It was the qualifying associations themselves. But uh, increasingly, of course, uh, it proved to be impossible for these qualifying associations themselves to organize the education of planners. And so they started recognizing university courses uh, on condition that they met certain requirements to uh, uh, provide exemption for the uh, entrance examination. Uh, now, this is a mechanism that works very well in the United Kingdom. It gives the qualifying associations power over university curricula, but it, uh, it, it doesn't um, require them to organize education themselves. Now, this is the environment in which I arrived when I was in the United Kingdom, and we were, uh, it was a small school at that time, but we were trying to, for our graduates, to get exemption from the entrance examination of the, at that time, Royal Town Planning Institute. And uh, that same Royal Town Planning Institute had, in the meantime, changed its mind Originally, it limited access to the profession of town planners to architects, surveyors, and, uh, and engineers. So only surveyors, engineers, and architects could do an additional course in town planning to become qualified town planners. So the, these institutions are absolutely dominant. But in the meantime, and this happened in the 19. Uh, uh, late 1960s, 1970s. In the meantime, uh, the um, uh, Town Planning Institute had switched uh, to recognizing planners only. So people from the social sciences, in particular geographers, after having done an additional course in planning, could also become chartered town planners. Now, um, now you it, this is, I explained this in detail because I didn't find anything like that uh, when I arrived in the Netherlands. In the Netherlands, it was a totally different educational scene. Uh, the educational scene was uh, town planners, urban designers, uh, uh, ontwerpers, as the term is called, educated at the technical universities, in particular, of course, at Delft. Uh, they had laid claim to uh, uh, being the planners proper, but they don't call themselves planners. They call themselves stedebauers, urban designers, the Delft tradition. And, and they, they built on a tradition of Van Lohuizen and uh, Van Eesteren and, uh, uh, and, uh, and, and other leading urban designers in the interwar period and the immediate post-war period. So that was one form of planning education. But in the meantime, and this is the parallel um, um, with uh, the United Kingdom, in the meantime, geographers also laid claim to planning. And here, uh, there were two prominent uh, uh, geographers uh, who themselves called themselves planners, uh, Willem Steigenga in Amsterdam and uh, uh, Wissing in, in Nijmegen, who uh, promoted an alternative form of planning education uh, based on geography. And uh, these two traditions in the Netherlands fought it out with, with each other. Uh, um, 
Now, and, and uh, I'm saying this because I want to, uh, I had switched from, from Delft to Amsterdam. So I was in Amsterdam. I was on the side of planologists, the, the planologe in, in German, in, uh, uh, in Dutch. Uh, uh, now, um, the, uh, what I also need to say is that Dutch university education itself was in turmoil. It was long, it was expensive. The government wanted to get a handle on the costs of planning education. So they, they were trying to uh, uh, standardize and, and streamline university education. And that happened in the very early 1980s. And uh, as, a, as part of that, they decided that uh, all courses should be uniformly four or maximum five years. And they abolished the kind of education which planning provided, which was called Bovenbau education. It's too complicated to explain what exactly it is, but they offered, the, 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 the government offered us at Amsterdam and at Nijmegen the opportunity also to become fully fledged planning courses from the start. Very similar to what uh, I had done in, uh, uh, in the United Kingdom, full planning education. I, my, what I said at that time, if you want to catch planners, catch them young. Uh, get them from secondary school immediately at the end of their final examination for secondary school and educate them then. And we pulled it off. We pulled it off. So planning courses at Amsterdam became fully fledged courses from for entrance rather than being grafted onto courses in geography. Uh, but this was, geography didn't like it. Uh, and uh, so therefore this kind of course was in a vulnerable position. So when I went to Kappenberg uh, to the meeting with Klaus Kunzmanners, I was looking for support, international support, international recognition. and. Uh, uh, and, and so it was Klaus Kuntmann, so was uh, um, Louis Albrecht in, 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 uh, uh, in Leuven, in Belgium. Uh, we were banding together a small band of warriors, if you want, yes, who all wanted to protect uh, planning education proper. Um, and, and this is really, in, in my perception, uh, the, was the moving force behind setting up ASOP. At, uh, the, the founding conference was held in 19, I think it was 1980 or thereabout in Amsterdam. I organized it. And from that moment onwards, uh, uh, the, the, the second conference was held in, in, in Leuven. Uh, no, the second conference was actually held in Dortmund. Dortmund, of uh, Klaus Kunzmann, of course. Um, Dortmund was important in, in one respect, and this relates to what I have said bef uh, before. The uh, general secretary of the Royal Town Planning Institute turned up and he explained a worry which the, the, the British planning profession had at that point, point. And the worry was the um, um, a, a guideline by the European Commission for mutual recognition of diplomas. You have now a guideline in the EU saying that if somebody is qualified to, for a trade or a profession in one country, he or she is also qualified to practice that trade or profession in other countries. Uh, subject to minimal conditions, learning the language and learning the local law. Now here you had the Royal Town Planning Institute, 16,000 members with a the whole world behind it, the world of the, uh, domin the dominions and the, uh, uh, the, the whole commonwealth, which all practice this particular uh, policy. Yeah? On the one hand, and the European uh, Union, uh, which Britain had joined at that time, with totally different uh, uh, sets of rules as far as planning is concerned. There was no other country in in, in, uh, in Europe, which had the same rules, which, had, which even had the institutions of qualifying associations. In, in, in the Netherlands, if you study planning, have a diploma in planning, you are qualified to, to, to do, act as a planner. Yeah? Uh, 
in 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 the United Kingdom, you have to be part member of the Royal Town Planning Institute, pass their entrance examination, or pass a, a, a course which has been recognized by the Town Planning Institute. You also have to two years recognized practice. Now, quite of a sudden, they were absolutely uh, flabbergasted uh, by the uh, the possibility of a planner from Spain turning up in the United Kingdom and saying, I have done a planning course at Madrid or what there, wherever. I am qualified to practice planning in Spain. Therefore, I am now qualified to practice in the United Kingdom. That was their fear. So ESO began to play a role now in, in, in this game. Yes? Uh, the the uh, ESO has instituted uh, uh, sort of entrance requirements of its own. Uh, being a recognized planning course, recognized by ESO, uh, quite of a sudden seemed to take on a, a importance. Uh, uh, why? Because that might provide you with an entrance ticket to practicing the profession in other member states of the European Commission, uh, community. So uh, that was an important uh, element uh, in the rise of the Association of European Schools of Planning, which went beyond expectations. I mean, there are what 130, 140 members now. The, the, uh, members came along from from Azerbaijan and and from uh, uh, all sorts of countries and say, "I want to join and I want to 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 practice in." Uh, to be able to practice in my own country, but also in, in various other countries, because I am a graduate of a recognized ESO planning school. Uh, I mean, this was the idea. Uh, now, in the meantime, in my perception, this has faded into the background. It's, 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 it's almost, uh, uh, it, it has not been of the importance that, uh, has been attached to this at that time, not in my perception anyway. And uh, ESOP itself has also changed from in character. It has become much more of an academic association nowadays. Certainly the conferences, rather than discussing issues of, of, of planning education and issues of the recognition of the profession, which was a topic originally, have become much more now academic conferences were, providing opportunities for papers or draft papers being presented, providing an opportunity for PhD can, uh, candidates for a PhD to present that paper. Uh, also, of course, there's the additional role which ESOP has now taken on to be, first of all, to organize joint, joint conferences with the United States, with uh, ACSP and organizing world conferences. Uh, 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 it, 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 it has almost forgotten about this uh, this role which it had, which is also probably irrelevant these days. I have no judgment on that, but uh, I see that the the the, the story of ASOP has uh, as as originally conceived has been as, as as well as forgotten. Most likely because it's not important anymore. Uh, I have no complaints about this, but I just want to provide this information. Uh, um, now, Dutch planning education itself, uh, it has also changed uh, to my mind, but also and in particular because the role of planning in Dutch society has changed. I mean, uh, there used to be a Rijks Planologische Dienst, Willem Salet has talked about that, and uh, there used to be Provinciale Planologische Dienst, the term planology, uh, planology. It, it, it did play a role. That was a, it, it, uh, the profession of planner uh, It was not recognized in any formal sense, but it it, it did exist. But I, I, at the moment, I I don't think it it has the same uh, significance. I don't think there is uh, the, the same uh, ident professional identity anymore, uh, which has something to do also with. Uh, uh, the changes of university courses. I mean, uh, Willem, uh, uh, you, you know much more about this than, than I, but we used to be a, an independent sub-faculty of planning. 
Now planning is part of the huge faculty of social sciences. That's it. It, uh, uh, I, I'm not sure uh, about whether planning education has the same distinct identity within that huge faculty. And it's the same in at NIMED. It's the, same. the only uh, university course in, in, uh, in the Netherlands which maintains its identity as a planning course, to my mind, is Groningen. But I, uh, I may be wrong about this. And, uh, uh, I, I finish at that but this particular point because uh, I have been out of planning education uh, for a long time um, and, and European planning has really filled my, my agenda for the past 25 years uh, and uh, I, I'm not, not, not an actor on the Dutch scene anymore um, except that I'm still based in the Netherlands and based at Delft University of Technology which provides me with a home uh, for which I am grateful. Uh, well, uh, thank you very much, uh, Roberto. Thanks. Um, <laughs> um, uh, this was my original brief which you gave me. Uh, yes, yes, yes. <laughs> we we my uh, original brief. Yeah, the brief was uh, quite uh, broad, I have to say. But uh, yeah, yeah, we wanted to explore uh, both the history of Dutch planning, yeah. which was more explored by Professor Willem Salet, and the history of ASOP, which was now explored by you. Thank you so much. Yeah. Uh, we do have time for a few questions, and I see uh, there is one question in the in the chat from from a, a, a friend. I think from um, I don't know where you are from, uh, Ahmed. If you could uh, introduce yourself and tell us your question. Uh, hello, good morning, everybody. I am from Egypt. Uh, uh, I really enjoyed the talk uh, of Professor William and uh, the comment uh, of Professor Andrew Faludi. Uh, I was educated in uh, civic design development uh, at Liverpool University. Uh, I worked with uh, Gerard Dix and Peter Betty, and I enjoyed the history of planning in the Netherlands, but I would like to, uh, to ask about the changing or transition of planning since uh, 60 to now, and what is the effect of technology in planning thought? Uh, as well, what is the relation between the transition studies and the current planning thought? I, I, uh, I worked on, oh, uh, I have a chat with. Uh, Dirk Lowbeck, who's a pioneer in urban transitions, and that urban transition has affected our thinking of planning uh, in the last few day, uh, years, uh, maybe 15 or 20 years. And that changing of thought has affected global and no, uh, global north and uh, south uh, as well. well uh, what I, I asking on uh, is how we can handle it, this change in our beginning communication. Thank you, so, Ahmed. Uh, yeah, let's try to keep the questions uh, also compact so we have more time for, for people to, but thank you so much for your question. Uh, I don't know who wants to, to answer, uh, Willem or, or Andreas? If I may, I want to duck this question because, as I said, since 1995, I've really <laughs> looked at the development of the European uh, Union, the European integration and, and uh, uh, whatever planning it does, but it, it, it's not concerned with urban transition. So, uh -huh. uh, Willem, I think it falls on you. Well, um, Ahmed, uh, thank you for your question. Also, your written question. And uh, you all know what is the role of technology in the progress of technology in planning. And I think it's, it's extremely important. Certainly, if you go to the material challenges of, of planning, for instance, the energy transition, the infrastructure, and so on, there are a lot of new technological inventions, open new worlds. And at the same time, I have to say that um, the 
practical use of uh, technology also depend on the norms that are, that are resting on them, on the normative conditions. And that's extremely important. Without it, they can never be practiced. Um, um, the, the, for instance, um, uh, when you look at, at, at energy transition, um, we have a lot of aspirations in many countries, also in the Netherlands, a lot of sky high aspirations. We want to go for this energy transition. There's a lot of new technology there. So there are a lot of opportunities. And at the same time, you have to wonder what is the normative setting in which this policy may be successful and effective. And uh, there are norms about First of all, there are, I think there are four different sorts of norms. First, norms of uh, guaranteeing the availability, uh, the reliable availability of enough energy. That's important. The second, of course, is the climate dimension. What is, uh, um, how can we uh, uh, deal with all issues of climate? Um, the third is, uh, about protective laws, uh, for instance, uh, biodiversity or th these kinds of things. And the fourth are the set of social distributive norms. Who is paying for the new technology and who takes profit of it? And um, uh, this is, this is my, my, the, the point of my debate. I think this normative setting is not adequately uh, established in order to enable an effective energy transition in many countries. In our countries, uh, only the first norm that I mentioned, the reliable availability of enough energy, that's very well settled. And our network organizations are even obligated to, to, um, to guarantee a, a, a reliable service. But all other three sorts of norms, the distributive norms, the protective norms, the climate norms, uh, have to be uh, conquered by the protest, by the contestation of the population. They are not, not yet integrated in the decision-making bodies. And that's really, that's a problem. And I think this is the case in more countries, certainly in, in Europe, as far as I can see. So we have to restore this balance between normative conditions and purposive aspirations. Thank you. Thank you so much, Professor Salat. Uh, I know that there are a few members of our own spatial planning and strategy who are, uh, have burning questions. Uh, Joanna, uh, uh, do you want to say your question? Um. Yes. Yeah. So my, my question is, if you could highlight again, uh, what were the main drivers for the early and uh, unique uh, tradition of planning at national level in the Netherlands? You want to ask? Ah, okay. <laughs> <laughs> um, well, first of all, that, uh, Dutch uh, planners had the idea to regulate urban development at the national level early on. That was actually before World War II, 1938. Yes. Um, um, they related this to the idea that they themselves should be in charge. So they were sort of really thinking in terms of blueprint planning, if you want. Um, uh, as I indicated um, uh, in my response to uh, William Salet, um, under German occupation, the Germans encouraged Dutch planners to continue with this, this idea and to, to actually put it into legislation. Now, this legislation was, because it was under German occupation, interim legislation. And it, it was interim legislation which nominally, not, uh, nothing really happened, but nominally allowed uh, the um, uh, formulation of a national plan that here you have the, uh, the crystallization of a particular planning idea, crystallization of blueprint planning. Right? A national plan 
we should regulate in future the uh, urban expansion. Um, immediately after the war, um, it was decided that uh, this uh, German pro uh, provisional act, which was uh, promulgated under German uh, occupation, it could not be transposed into Dutch planning le legislation proper. It needed to be adapted, yeah? uh, adapted to uh, Dutch norms, Dutch legal standards. Yeah? Uh, this is a process which took 20 years, yeah? uh, almost 20 years. Uh, uh, and in the meantime, uh, a more subtle form of uh, planning uh, was conceptualized under which uh, there would be no national blueprint, but only kind of national guidelines. And, um, uh, and Willem Sonnet mentioned this in 1960, eventually, uh, to, to, to support this idea, uh, the Dutch government gave an idea of what planning might look like, but not, uh, uh, not it, it didn't provide a blueprint. It only conceptualized urban development at the national scale. And uh, uh, this was then included in the uh, uh, in, in legislation. Actually, my first visit after hitchhiking to the Netherlands when I was 17, my first visit to the Netherlands was in 1965, only months before this act would be become law because it took three years for the, the act to in, be introduced. So it was meant to come into law on the 1st of August, 1965. I was there in May and I was actually uh, visiting with the uh, Dutch National Planning Agency, right? I felt their, their excitement about this law to become, uh, uh, to become uh, operational on the 1st of August. Everybody talked about it. Uh, um, and uh, the story of Dutch planning from about that moment on, the 65 to um, uh, 75, and eventually through to 95, was one of operationalizing this idea of the Dutch uh, national government making certain guidelines, setting out certain ideas, but in a in a in a almost physical sense of the term, uh, including. Uh, indications with maps of what the development of the Netherlands should look like. And this was not uh, done through blueprint planning, but it was set through setting out a strong idea of what the Netherlands uh, was and what the Netherlands should look like, uh, uh, given that the Dutch population was expanding rapidly. And there, was, there were famous forecasts from dating from 1965 that the Dutch population by the year 2000 would be 20 million. Well, it's now in the order of uh, almost 18, eh? but we are now 21 years further. Eh? Um, and um, uh, to support this, these ideas, the Dutch also drew maps of, of the Netherlands. What should the Netherlands look like, given that uh, this number of people and uh, this number of houses had to be accommodated. And, and these maps, which were not blueprints, but indicative, they played a strong role, in particular because they, um, they were based on, a, a, on an idea. And the, this idea was to keep the core of the densely populated Western Netherlands, the Green Heart free, and to develop uh, instead the ring of cities which already existed to make them uh, uh, to, to make them expand, uh, to, to allocate the new housing. Uh, Willem Sadet was quoting the numbers, uh, 500,000, 600,000 houses in specific uh, places, specific towns and cities, uh, which were willing to and able to, with the help of the government, with the help of uh, all so-called sector ministries, to actually do this development. Uh, it became uh, a machine. I mean, I, that, uh, I, uh, uh, I certainly agree with William Sarret in that respect. It became a machine, a steamrolling development in, to, to, to 
conform to ideals which the government had. And, uh, Andreas, uh, yeah. uh, we are, uh, uh, there are lots oh, of questions pop popping sure. up. And I'm, uh, <laughs> we are uh, closing in the right end. <laughs> uh, do you want to conclude? Sorry. Uh, I, I, I want to conclude, yes, I mean, <laughs> uh, um, it, I, I translated this into the terms of a Dutch doctrine. Uh, uh, keep the green heart open and develop uh, uh, the, the areas designated growth centers so as to accommodate growth. And, and this worked and it, it continues to work, actually. If you look at the so-called Phoenix Locatius, uh, which continue to be developed more or less where, where the government says, okay, let's develop. Uh, even without a, a, a central planning, central planning has been abolished, but the idea continues. So that's my story. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> uh, sorry to press you. We are uh, well, getting close to the end of your, our- uh, You fulfill your role as chair. Yeah. yeah, we have time for uh, one or two more questions. If Manatave, uh, if you if you don't mind, I will first pose a Verena's question, and then we go back to you, right? Uh, just to give a little bit of balance in the in the answers. Uh, Verena, would you like to say your question to Professor Salet? Yeah, just very briefly. I have the idea that um, the most recent period in planning was first instigated by the observation that the law as it was is too uh, complicated. And then it became uh, a sort of self um, yeah, fulfilled, fulfilling prophecy um, that was implemented also during a time of lots of reorganization in ministries and so forth. So I have the idea that the sort of monster that you describe, um, yeah, happened rather in accidentally. So I, I would like to ask if you agree on that. And I would also like to ask what you, um, what this implies, um, yeah. Uh, uh, thank you for your question, uh, Verena. Um, uh, I think uh, it didn't happen completely incidentally. A planning is also what happens. A planning is also an expression of the, of the mood of time and certainly of political changes. But um, on top of this, I think uh, my concern with <coughs> planning and not just in the spatial field, but in, in many uh, policy fields at the moment, is the dominance of what I call managerialism. And it's it's, it's incredible that uh, even at the high tide of liberalism, which is over already, but in, we had a lot of it in the last 15 years, I guess, um, even at the high tides of liberalism, uh, the state was not acting liberal at all. It was, uh, it was uh, becoming more professional and more um, managerializing than ever. The, the, the instrumentalism, the instrumentalist dimension of planning was stronger in this liberal period than in the period before. That's unbelievable. That, so in a way, this is taking its autonomous uh, growth path. And this is, uh, uh, we have to get rid of this. I, I think this is really um, uh, um, giving all power to the administration without normative conditions, open delegation, concentrating all powers with, with the managers. That's actually what's happening. This is a drama for all sorts of public planning at the moment. And it happens also in other countries. Um, it's, um, Will also was asking about the welfare state. The, the welfare state is changing. We are a new epoch now, but still the uh, uh, residues of the previous states are so strong, uh, so strong there, this uh, managerialism. That's, uh, I, I think this is our largest problem at the moment. Thank you, Th thank you uh, Professor Salat. Uh, let's, let's go back to Manatave, uh, and we are really very close to, 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 to the end. 
Manata, would you like to say your question? I can also read it. Maybe she's not there. She's not there yet. Uh, okay. So um, I don't see Manatave coming up. Uh, so maybe we should go to uh, Vil Zonafeld. Vil, would you like to, to say what uh, you have a very, very interesting point. I think it deserves to be uh, said loud. Yes, uh, thank you, uh, Roberto. I liked uh, Willem's story very much about what you can call the rise and fall of, uh, of Dutch planning. And my point is, should it be also linked to grander developments in uh, policy and uh, politics? You can see the rise of spatial planning in the Netherlands as a sort of territorial component of the welfare state, mm. its fall as a disappearance of a state. Uh, uh, policy, including housing. Yes, so the, the so-called marriage between housing and spatial planning is uh, not only spatial planning is gone, housing is gone, so the, the marriage is uh, completely uh, gone. And I liked uh, Willem's final comment which he made, is, is the, the dominance of a sort of, seems to be kind of managerial uh, approach and uh, instrumentalism in, uh, in policy and uh, politics. So uh, in, in that sense, my story is... Uh, very much uh, linked to what Vincent, to what sorry, Vincent, to what Willem is uh, is uh, is saying. So I don't have a question. It was just final uh, sort of uh, of comment. Comment, uh, not too much focus on internal developments in a policy domain, but try to see the grand picture as well. I fully agree. I fully agree with with. Uh, it's not, not a question, it's, it's a suggestion that you make, uh, an observation, and I fully agree with this observation that uh, always we are, as planner, acting in, in a larger world and uh, the changing moods of time are so important for the position that we as planners can take. Andreas told us that uh, 40 years ago uh, the planners were a sort of emancipation process in order to um, um, to conquer a position as spatial planners against it was in the beginning of this this uh, welfare state then in the 1960s and it went on until the 1990s in the 1990s we came at the end of an uh, over asked uh, administrative state and then we got some liberalization everywhere in the, in, the, in the West, everywhere. And at the same time, we still have today these residues. And um, I think when, uh, when there's a liberal epoch, we have to find as planners ways to act in that period. I think in a liberal epoch, there's a lot to do for planners. In all periods, there's a lot to do for planners, but you have to conquer in a different way with different arguments. You have to reposition yourself um, and uh, to correct the, the failures of pure liberalism as well. But we didn't witness pure liberalism, <laughs> not in our country. Uh, that's that's uh, what surprises me so much. Um, what we witnessed is, is sort of... Uh, uh, um, choice for uh, large industries and the lobby of large industries they have become very important but in um, in, in, in terms of, of liberalism we have uh, witnessed the opposing things not the countervailing powers within the state in order to 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 prevent the concentration of power in one hand and it, in order to prevent uncontrolled power but in contrary we got in all fields of our uh, governmental policies, even more concentrations of administrative power. And this is, this is something that concerned me already 40 years, but now even more than 20 years ago. That's a bit surprising. We are really uh, almost closing, but uh, I promised that I would make this question. So a very short question and maybe very short answer from both of you. 
uh, how does uh, how does um, Dutch planning react to environmental disasters? Um, did uh, is it is it reacting well? I'm uh, reinterpreting a little bit Manatve's uh, Manatve's uh, question. Uh, or does flood and water always considered, uh, were always considered in spatial planning? So very short answers, just to, who would like to say something? Maybe well, Andreas. I, I'm impressed by it. Uh, Oops. Necessary planners, but that is an obvious thing uh, consider and cope with. Uh, uh, the, the, the threats of water, I mean, both the sea as well as uh, the rivers. So uh, that's that's one area which the, the Dutch, uh, they don't have it under control, but they tackle it uh, in, in, a, in a most impressive manner. Right? Uh, it's sectorial, of course, up to a point, but it's within those reactions, it's fairly comprehensive at the same time. If we, if we look at uh, what's happening along the River Rhine, uh, uh, as it enters uh, the Netherlands and how, how, how the, uh, there have been floods in Germany, but the water had, one way or the other has come to the Netherlands. In the Netherlands, there has been very little problem, actually. <laughs> Indeed. Yeah. Uh, yes. <laughs> so so, so we, uh, the, the, the provisions that have been made over the past couple of decades have worked. And uh, the same up to a point with the sea. I can't, I'm not, I'm not somebody to predict uh, the sea level rise and so forth, but it's being looked at and actively uh, considered. And uh, uh, there's a sort of self evidence almost of, uh, yes, we have to, to uh, but it's something done by engineers. Yes? Uh, <laughs> Friends, uh, our, our uh, audience is dwindling up because people uh, have to leave. Yeah. So, uh, uh, Carissa and Jamela, sorry, sorry, but we will have to forego your questions. On behalf of the Delft University of Technology and the Chair of Spatial Planning, led uh, by our uh, very own uh, Wilsonefeld, who's here, um, I thank you so very much, uh, you both. I learned a tremendous lot today, and I'm sure everybody learned a tremendous lot today. And uh, uh, we will, we will uh, contact you for, for the transcriptions of your talks and answers. And hopefully we will do a little bit of a publication out of this, I hope, all right? Thank you so very much everyone for, for being here today and for uh, uh, staying at, until the end. I'll see you in our next SPS um, seminar. We will inform you via email about other, uh, other uh, things we organize. For now, thank you so much and goodbye. Thank you. Thank, thank you. you. Bye. Thank bye. you. Bye, bye, bye. Thank you, all of you. <laughs>